Okay, so welcome back to this next video on bacterial charity and uh, norfloxacin resistance in Escherichia coli. Okay, uh, so uh, in the previous video what we saw was that we were going to expose our E. coli on our agar plate to a level of norfloxacin that was capable of blocking um, protein synthesis within uh, these E. coli cells, but was not high enough to actually kill them. So it wasn't high enough to have bactericidal effect, but it was high enough to block their uh, protein synthesis, and in do so doing, it would stop them from dividing, basically. So this really is the dose needed in order to achieve bacteriostatic effect, and there's a special name for that dose. That's the minimal inhibitory concentration for your antibiotic, basically. Okay, so now let's move on. Let's say... Uh, we have our agar plate here, and we have exposed our E. coli cells on this agar plate to uh, this minimal inhibitory concentration of norfloxacin. So these bacterial cells are in the minimal inhibitory, uh, minimal, uh, inhibitory concentration of uh, norfloxacin. Inhibitory concentration of norfloxacin. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, on this plate, uh, there will be uh, some bacterial cells uh, which are completely, um, completely non-resistant to the norfloxacin. So, let's say this one is one that is completely susceptible to the norfloxacin. This is known as an LRI. Uh, standing for less resistant isolate. And it's called that because if you take it out of the plate and uh, put it on a, on a plate on its own, basically, then the norfloxacin will easily stop its function, basically. Okay, at this minimal inhibitory concentration, norfloxacin will easily stop its function, basically. Uh, so this doesn't show very great resistance to um, the uh, norfloxacin, basically. But when it's with the other, when it's on a whole plate with the others, it's fine. It's not going to be affected by this minimal inhibitory concentration of norfloxacin. Okay, so this is a very interesting phenomenon, basically, that if you have it on a plate with other, um, other um, bacteria which are resistant to norfloxacin, so let's say this is an HRI, standing for high resistance inoculate, uh, sorry, not high resistance uh, inoculate, high resistance isolate. Okay, so basically, what I'm trying to say here is that putting this bacteria which is susceptible to norfloxacin on a culture plate with a bacterium that is resistant to norfloxacin is going to make this one also resistant to norfloxacin to some extent. And I want to now explain why. Okay, right. Uh, so... Basically, let's start. The story starts with the high-resistance isolate. So let's take this bacterial cell here, which we said was going to be a high-resistance isolate, which is basically a cell which is resistant to norfloxacin. Okay, so for whatever reason, this E. coli cell is not being affected by uh, the norfloxacin. So basically, its protein synthesis is absolutely fine. And basically what it does is it makes an enzyme known as a tryptophuanase. A tryptophuanase. And the specific tryptophuanase that this enzyme, uh, that this bacterium makes is a TNAA. That's what it's called. Tryptophuanase is this TNA bit. And this A here just is the uh, specific tryptophuanase it is. So the tryptophuanase that this, um, that this E. coli makes is called TNAA. Okay, so let me repeat what I've said so far. This is a bacterium that I took off this plate which is resistant to norfloxacin. Okay, so it has not had its um, protein synthesis uh, jeopardized by this enzyme. So it is still, sorry, by this drug. So it is still making proteins, and one of the proteins it makes is this tryptophuanase. 
Okay, now what do tryptophanases do? Well, basically they break down the end, uh, the amino acid tryptophan. Okay, so let me show you the structure of the amino acid tryptophan then. Okay, right, so uh, if this is the alpha carbon of the amino acid, and let's make this the amino group up here of the tryptophan, uh, this alpha carbon needs a hydrogen coming off it, and also a carboxyl group coming off down here. Right, so there's the gen generic structure of an amino acid so far. Now let's draw the bit that is specific to tryptophan. So tryptophan now has this carbon off here, and then it has another carbon coming down here, which is double bonded to this one. A carbon off here, carbon like so here, and then a nitrogen here, okay, with a hydrogen like that. And uh, then off here you have a benzene ring, basically like so. Okay, um, and then we need alternating single and double bonds like that. Okay, now we just need to put hydrogens on any uh, free bonds. So here's a free bond, here's a free bond, here's a free bond, and here's a free bond. Now this ring that you have here, the, well this double ring, you have a six-membered ring attached to a five-membered ring, this whole structure here, let me highlight it, this entire structure here. Oh, wait, 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 I've drawn tryptophan wrong. I've missed a little bit out. Uh, there is a methylene group in between this alpha carbon and this um, indole ring, as I was about to label it up. Uh, where can I draw that? Darn. Uh, let's have a me methylene group here, okay, with its two hydrogens, and then it's bonded to that. So get rid of that completely. Okay, so you've got a methylene group between the alpha carbon here and the indole ring. That was embarrassing. Right. I love amino acid structures usually, but this one's a more difficult one. Okay, so um, here is the um, here is the indole ring. So this is the indole ring, and that's a name that chemists gave it. Uh, so if you uh, type it on Google, aromatic rings, and look at the um, look at the Wikipedia page, you will find indole at some point. Okay. So the indole ring is this six-membered ring attached to this five-membered ring. This entire structure here is known as an indole ring. Now, tryptophanase is basically going to cleave this bond here between uh, the uh, indole ring of tryptophan and uh, the rest of the amino acid structure. And to do that, it's going to use water. So it's going to bring in water and this is the enzyme it's now going, uh, this is the reaction it's now going to catalyze. So the first bit is easy. It's going to basically cleave this bond between the methylene group and the indole group. And it's going to, excuse me, use one of the hydrogens from the water to bond to this carbon here of the indole ring and create you a pure indole ring. So let's draw that out, okay? So it's just this exact same structure here. Um, here we go, and then the nitrogen coming down here. But now you have a hydrogen on this carbon here instead of the methylene group attaching it to the tryptophan. And then we need to draw our benzene here. Okay. Right, um, carbon there, double bond there, hydrogen here, hydrogen here, hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. So you get indole as a product, and that's very, very important. We're going to see how this indole ring is really important uh, for the signaling between these uh, uh, norfloxacin resistant uh, E. coli bacteria and these non uh, norfloxacin resistant E. coli. Right, okay, now the rest of this is slightly more complicated because um, one of the hydrogens of this water is going to go onto um, the um, methylene group here to make a methyl group. So what you're going to get is a um, methyl group here. So let me draw that because that bit is at least simple. So this is the methyl group that is now coming off this alpha carbon here. So I'll draw the alpha carbon. So I hope it's clear what I'm doing. This is the methylene group here, which has now become a methyl group. So you've used the other hydrogen from water to bind there. 
Okay, now what you do is you take off this hydrogen and this amino group, and they become ammonia, basically. So you get nitrogen bonded to free hydrogens to make ammonia. And then you double bond the remaining oxygen from the water molecule to this carbon, and then you have this carboxyl group coming down here. Now, I've drawn this in a weird way to sh be able to show it sort of like in the position of amino an amino acid. But maybe if I draw that molecule again in a more familiar way, you might just recognize what that is. Because that's a very, very important molecule in biochemistry. Uh, really important. I'll give you a clue. Glycolysis. This here is the structure of pyruvic acid or pyruvate. This specifically, what I've drawn is pyruvic acid. Pyruvate is the molecule with this proton removed, basically, the conjugate base of pyruvic acid. But basically, that's what this tryptophanase does. It splits tryptophan into an indole ring along with ammonia and pyruvic acids. So you get these free products, basically, uh, from this uh, breakdown of tryptophan. Okay, and in the next video, we'll see how this indole is really important in signaling between uh, the different bacteria in this E. coli culture.